Kia ora tatu, uh, welcome to Te Matatiki Toy Order, uh, welcome to the Art Centre. Uh, my name's Corbin Theaika and uh, I've got the privilege, uh, or two privileges actually. One, I'm a trust, uh, trustee of the Art Centre here, but I've also uh, got, it's actually a bit probably more of a burden than a privilege, of introducing uh, my relation here, poor media, uh, Paratagoro, who's going to share with us this evening uh, the cultural narrative. Uh, and so I believe this is the second of three uh, events that are happening here at the Art Centre, specifically for Heritage Week. And uh, the theme this year, as, is, as it is in most years actually, is people in place. And so uh, when we think about people in place, it's really uh, cultural narrative and people in place is inherently connected. And so uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Poor Media, who's, uh, we can never quite figure out which what sort of relationship it is between us. Auntie. <laughs> Auntie nephew. <laughs> Bossing me around tonight, so we'll go with that one. Um, but I've had the privilege of uh, working with Poor Media uh, on a number of in initiatives over the years, uh, particularly in the arts, culture and heritage space. And in terms of uh, someone who's actively involved in that sector, uh, you can't really beat Poor Media from a local uh, Ngaitua Huriri, Ngati Whekea, like to do a hickey hickey perspective as well. Uh, and so, uh, without dragging things on for too much longer, would like to uh, hand over to Pua Media Parataguru. Kia ora. Katu au ki te taumata, te poho tamate a te mauka, ka titiro atu ki te moana, ko whakarau po erere atura, Te rapa ki o te raki whakaputa, tu mai ra te whare tipuna ko whake. Hui hui a mai te iwi e, tihei mauri ora e. E aku nui, e aku rahi nei rā, te rua hiki hiki nei rā. A feke nei rā, a ira kehung nei rā, a tu ahuriri, a hui rapa e mihi kauana ki a koutou tēnei pō, nau mai tahuti mai rā koutou, ki tō mātou nei, ki tō mātou nei taa kaika, o tautahi, a ngā pākihi whakateka teka o Waitaha. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Pua Media, and uh, as Corbin says, I am a descendant of Ngai Tua Huriri. I am a descendant of this beautiful little, uh, the river area, the river era for um, Tua Huriri. I am a descendant of Rapaki, which was the waiata I sung at the beginning to introduce myself and my maunga from Rapaki. I am a descendant of uh, Ngai Te Rua Hiki Hiki from Lake Ellesmere. I am a descendant of Mako uh, and Little River. I am a descendant of several generations who married themselves. And I do not have six toes or a third nipple or a third eye, which is kind of surprising when you look through my whakapapa, because I should have. Um, I am several generations of Ngaitahu. My primary whakapapa lines take me from Tuahu Dedi in North Canterbury on my mother's whakapapa and on my father's whakapapa uh, to a little place uh, called Pukitaraki, uh, which is just north of Dunedin, right beside a little place called Karitane, where the Plunkett 
movement starts all the way down to bluff at the bottom of the island. So I am a Ngaitahu child through and through and through, generation after generation, and I'm very privileged to be here tonight to share this kōrero. So thank you to my brother, nephew, cousin, Corbin. Yes. <laughs> As Corbin um, explained, uh, we have worked on a number of kaupapa together over the years, including most recently a number of repatriations from Canterbury Museum uh, back to Rapa Nui in Easter Island and to Oregon uh, in the States. We potentially have a return to go to uh, Hawaii and to the Chatham Islands and potentially Oz. So I'm banking them up, so we've still got a bit of work to do on that front. Uh, but I am... Uh, privileged to be here today and thank Corbin for opening our proceedings uh, tonight. I am privileged and somewhat nervous that my whanaunga are here, the Auntie Miriamas times two and Uncle Henare and the cousins. Um, uh, I will ask you to forgive uh, any of my stuff that you look at me with a raised eyebrow about. Um, and, and my whanaunga here, Joe. Um, um, and, and to my new friends from the Russian community who have turned up tonight, I'm very grateful to see you here. Um, the story I'm telling to, to, tonight is a story of, which is a brief touch upon our history here uh, for our ancestors, uh, from Tuahuriri in particular, but they are also ancestors of those of any of us that have whakapapa te ngaitahu ngāti māmwe and waitaha. So what is the purpose? So sorry, I'll just step back. So I am all of these things. I am an ex-board member here of the Arts Centre. I'm a current board member across the road at Canterbury Museum for my sins. Um, I am an ex-employee uh, of Matapōpore Trust, which was the trust that was set up post-earthquake uh, to help Christchurch rebuild with a rebalanced voice. So part of that work with Matapōpore was to bring the stories of the land back out to the surface. So they are stories that we have known instinctively as people of this land, but they were stories that had been lost beneath the layers of the city. So post-earthquake, we had an opportunity to bring those stories forward. Uh, hence, there was born this whole stuff called cultural narrative. So what is a cultural narrative? A cultural narrative is an opportunity to share a different perspective. It is an opportunity to rebalance story. It is an opportunity to remember that history doesn't start with a building. History is in this land. This history has always been here. This is the opportunity to allow, to allow the land and the heavens and the gods and the ancestors to speak. For, for far too long, uh, we start history with a piece of paper. If it's on a piece of paper, therefore it is valid history. In my world, actually my name is history. My tipuna's names are history. And they may not be written down on a piece of paper, but they are written here. They are written in my DNA. And now is the time for that story, for those stories to be told again, and for those stories to be brought back to life. This is the opportunity that cultural narratives give to this generation. So I've been writing cultural narratives now for probably far too long, uh, but it is the opportunity afforded us post-earthquake. Uh, so that's my general, and I can't see my script, so if I go off script, I apologise now because I'm hopeless at following my own script. However... Uh, for the next hour or so, I'm going to introduce you firstly to four of my tipuna. Uh, most of the work that I do around cultural narrative is actually their story. So fortunately for us, uh, some of our tipuna actually wrote down kōrero. Uh, in other, um, uh, other ways, we had a number of ethnologists, historians, and just recorders of history that were recording um, our ancestors and taking their words and recording them so that we have a number of manuscripts still in existence aside from the stories that we still tell generation after generation. So in the next hour I'm going to introduce you to four of my tipuna. This is actually their narrative, it's not mine. I'm their voice for this generation that starts to bring their narrative alive. 
So without too much further ado, I will move on into the cultural narrative of, for Te Matatiki Toi Ora, which talks about a whakapapa taking us from the time of creation all the way through to migration, all the way to what's happening here today and now. And I'm hopeless with technology, so um, I'm going to try and make things happen. If they don't happen, just bear with me. So, whoop, whoop. there we go. I whānau au ki kai o poipā, ko ka whakaputa puta te ikua o te whare, i whānau ai o. The name I was born at Kaiapoi Pa, the name of the house I was born in was Ka Whakaputa Puta. You can read the rest of the kōrero for yourself. What the kōrero says in English is the principal fort of Ngaitahu for this island was Kaiapoi. Tūra Kautahi was the ancestor and it was he who occupied Kaiapoi and who had possession of the surrounding area. His elder brother was Tane Tiki, another was Hamua, and the younger brother was Moki, who had died before they reached Kaiapoi. My name is Nātana Hira Waru Waru Tu. This is the first of my ancestors I'd like to introduce you to. Nātana Hira Waru Waru Tu. What's happening here? In Māori world view, the first thing we do, Corbyn did it, I did it, we establish our right to be here. We establish our home. We establish our tu ranga wai wai. Tu, our standing ranga that connects my wai wai, tu ranga wai wai, my standing place that connects me to this place. Our tipuna here starts to introduce this place. What is important about this place, in this example, the important bit is Kaiapoi Pa. I'm going to come back and talk about Kaiapoi Pa. Uh, what we are doing here is establishing who is mana whenua, who is the people of the land, the people of this land, a ngai tuahuriri, who resided at Kaiapoi Pa. So, neira a tuahuriri e mihikawana kia koutou. So, I am tuahuriri and here I am. Who are we? So, I'm going to step back in time a wee bit. There's some familiar faces that some of you will be very, very familiar. This was taken way back yonder, seabed for sure. We were fighting for our rights to retain our traditional rights. Why are we doing this? Why did I bring this slide up? I have no idea. Let me just read my script. Let me introduce you <laughs> to our world. So often we are seen as a generation of Ngaitahu people that all of a sudden have popped up. We are a political force. Uh, we are an economic force. Well before that though, we were a number of tribes. What you see here uh, is the migration map. It is the map of our arrival in Aotearoa. It is our map of our arrival from the east coast to Te Waipounamu. It is a map of my ancestors' journeys through time. So the first part of this corridor, as you will see, uh, we were at three waves of migration. So often, uh, when we talk about migration, we think we tend to think that it ha this happens, and then that happens, and then this happens. But, you know, when we look at ourselves today, nothing ever happens like that. Constantly, multiple things are happening at one time. So there's lots of movement, there's lots of waves in and out. Although we identify three waves here, there are multiple waves coming in and out. These are the three that we most commonly identify as being the ancestors of Ngaitahu. So what we do know is the evidence tells us that our first wave into Te Waipounamu was with our, our tipuna Rākai Hautu. Rākai Hautu is seen to be arriving here oh, around the 1200s. 
Our oral traditions tell us that. More recently, one of my jobs at Canterbury Museum when I was an employee there about 13, 14 years ago, was to repatriate koiwi tangata, or human remains, uh, back to a place called Wairau Bar in the Marlborough area. One of the upsides of that repatriation, aside from allowing those ancestors that had been sitting in the museum far too long to go home and rest in the land, one of the other upsides of that was that there was able to be scientific research done on those remains. What that research is telling us is that, funnily enough, the first wave of people of which these koiwi tangata, all science tell us that these are the first wave migration into Aotearoa, were arriving around 1200-ish, give or take 50 years. Our oral traditions tell us our ancestor brought three groupings of people on the Uruau canoe. They were waitaha, uh, kahui tipua, kahui roko, kahui waitaha. Three groupings of people coming from uh, our homeland arrive in a little place called Whakatū, in, uh, which is now called Nelson, Nelson in Marlborough. They're landing around 1200. Scientific evidence of those remains found at Wairo Bar so there are a couple of groupings coming in with that first landing. They're landing in Wairo Bar and then they start to disperse. All of the scientific evidence is starting to mark it around this time. Māori sit here and go, oh, duh, we always knew this. We've always told our, been told story, generation after generation, and then the Uruau came, and upon the Uruau came three groupings of people. They came under, our, under the captaincy of our tipuna, Rākei Hautu. They then dispersed throughout the South Island. Rākei Hautu walks the island and starts to claim the island. He takes his core, uh, Tuhiraki, and he marks the land. Um, and, you know, the beautiful kōrero says, and he digs his digging stick into the land, and every time he digs it into the land, water appears. And so he starts to create all these beautiful waterways and these beautiful lakes. What he was actually doing was, and this is mine, and this is mine, and this is mine, kapai us, keep on moving down the island. But the story is much better when you say, and he digs his core into the land and water spouts out, and he names this place to me, to me, to me. He walks the land. His son takes the waka uruau, uh, te raki hoia. He circumnavigates the South Island. He meets up back with his father and he says to his father, there's a lot of kai down there in that place called Waitaha. Come down here, there's a big lake here. Well, yeah, there's a big lake here. It's got lots of kai. Come there. And so his father meets him here. The last two lakes that Rākai Hotu claims are two lakes right here in this region, Te Waihora, otherwise known as Te Kete Ika a Rākai Hautu, the fish basket of Rākai Hautu, then renamed Lake Ellesmere, and the lake beside it, Wairewa, then renamed Lake Forsyth. Those are the t last two lakes that Rākai Hautu claims he then takes that core, that digging stick, and he places it up on the mountain. Uh, that mountain gets called Tuhiraki. Then gets renamed Mount Bosu. And yes, I am saying that repetitive thing. And then gets renamed Koina. We won't labour that point too much longer. However, so first wave migration uh, then is 1200s, Rākai Hautu. Who are the main descendants of that? The main descendants of that are Waitaha. What does Waitaha do? Waitaha lays the names, the foundations of the names through the South Island. They then start to reside around the puku of the island, uh, around um, Timaru, Timuka, down towards Otago. They start to take out that space. If you're ever at the museum or ever down in Timaru and you see the rock art, 
those are the writings of Waitaha. They are first migration writings of Waitaha. First wave. Second wave comes in. The second wave is coming from the east coast of the North Island, uh, now known as, the, the iwi is now known as Kati Mamui. <laughs> With Kati Mamui, Mamui comes through the south. They follow all the way through Canterbury, all the way down through Otago. They start to head, head to the deep south. How do we know this? We follow the language. So with Kati Māmoi comes a dialectual change. So words which we might know up here like Aurangi, Aurangi, Mount Cook, Auraki, k -k -k -k. NG changes to K. So you start to see the changing of names of Ka Pākihi Whakateka Teka o Waitaha. The seed beds of Waitaha become Ka Pākihi, changing NGs to K. There is a lake here, which we just heard about, Te Waihora in Dunedin, the same name, Waihola. R changes to L, T's change to CH's, NG's change to K's, P's change to B's. So a whole language, different language starts to emerge. The naughty me, and I'm waiting for the lightning to strike, the naughty me says, because it was k -k 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 cold the further this is south you could go, go, go. So that's why we went from years to k -k 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 No lightning bolts, there you go. <laughs> so we follow that linguistic journey. So that second wave that comes through is this Kati Mamoi, which then settle in the south, they bring a whole new language. So with that language comes the Chichi Islands, otherwise known to us northern lot as the Titi Islands. My father's name, who's, brought, who's born and brought up down south, is known as Bula. When he's home, he was called Bula. When he was up here, his name is Pura. P-U-R-A changes to B-U-L-A. Second wave. So that second wave uh, is coming through in the 1500s. The third wave, which is the one we most commonly know, is Ngaitahu. And again, Ngaitahu's coming off that east coast of the North Island. We are travelling down and residing for some time in Kaikoura, for generations in fact, and then we come into Canterbury. By and large, we start to populate the Canterbury space, so the northern half of the Ngaitahu territory. Uh, Waitaha has now taken out the puku of the island. Māmoi have gone south. So we are three tribes in one space. Sometimes we get on, sometimes we don't. Uh, we marry each other, we kill each other off, we contest land, um, and then it becomes a little bit impossible for us to tell who's actually just this and not that anymore. So we have intermarried, we have given birth, we have done peace pacts, we have gone to war again, we've had significant feuds here on the peninsula and killed each other off and then loved each other again and had more children together. Um, what happens is that we start to head into the Renanga A Iwi Act 1990. We go to the Crown and say, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, Crown. Uh, 1840, we signed a treaty with you. 1848, uh, there's lots of our land purchased we are promised a whole heap of stuff. And you know what? Wasn't honoured. What are you going to do about that crown? So the crown says, well, actually, we don't know who you fellas are. So uh, you kind of have to make yourselves a legal entity. So what happens for Ngaitahu? Ngaitahu then gets forced into a space of which we never had imagined in our entire lives. So we get forced into a space where we have to find a united front under one entity, one legal entity. So no longer are we three tribes with multiple hapu, we now decide that we have to, to, to progress our claim, we have to become one identity. Hence, after many long years of debate and struggle, 
we start to take on a legal entity that says all of these things, we now will come under one banner and our iwi is ngaitahu. So we go, we move from this traditional basis of whakapapa rights, my genealogical rights connect me to ancestors to a point where actually because of Crown intervention we have no choice but to have to come into a new structure. That causes us a little bit of angst and 150 years battle. We, we, we quite like a good fight, we're quite good at it. Um, <laughs> And we have generations of us that fight this stuff. So I'm the new generation. Corbyn's a generation after me. Uh, we will continue the fight because this stuff's important for us. But what that does do, it starts to set up a legal entity. So no longer are we three tribes with multiple hapu. We become one tribe which incorporates these. We become five sub main sub-tribes. Uh, out of those main sub-tribes, we then became 18 communities. Those 18 communities then have a voice at a board table. That table is called Te Runanga o Ngaitahu. So we've now gone from this traditional base of my rights as an individual who has a blood connection to an ancestor now gets taken over by these interesting and weird and a little bit foreign structures that puts me into a wedge. Um, it has been the challenge for Ngaitahu Whanui to get to that point. But that is who we are. We are now currently um, 18 communities, of which uh, the community in particular that I speak on behalf of is Ngai Tuahuriri, who look after the North Canterbury area. Whaiapoi Pass sits up by Wood End, if you know where Wood End is. So when Ngai Tahu moves south with Ngāti Kuri, we start to come into Canterbury. Our main stronghold is at Kaiapoi Pa. It is a fortified pa. Uh, our people start to take residence there. From that point, we start to spread out across Canterbury. So our main chiefs are in that pa. Um, we go under siege from our whanaunga in the north, who decides he's got a bit of a beef with us. Uh, the, the pa falls that is significant in the Ngaitahu history because it changes the course of history for Ngaitahu. Why is that? Uh, Kaiapoi Pa is the main trading post in this region. The name Kaiapoi talks about that swinging in, poi to swing, the swinging in of resources into that community. So we're using that as our main trading port here in Canterbury. Um, when your main trading port gets taken out, your economy falls over. So changes the course of our economic wealth at that point. The second thing that happens is that our people become homeless. Our people from Kaiapoi Pa then disperse. They disperse south, north, east, west. By and large, they head south. Why is that important? A, we're now no longer on our land. We're no longer working our land. We're no longer being part of our land. We've moved south. This is 1832. 1848, there is a census taken of Ngaitahu peoples. On that day, wherever you were, you were listed as being from that place. Kaiapoi Pa is still empty. Kaiapoi Pa is sitting in Moiraki, it's sitting in uh, Otago, it's sitting everywhere else but Kaiapoi Pa. What happens under that 1848? census is that is then taken as the register for Ngaitahu descendants. Kaumatua live in 1848 who identify as Ngaitahu become the, the basis for the Ngaitahu role of which we are now over 60,000 membership registered. We have to be able to show our blood right to one of those 1848 Kaumatua. Easy enough-ish. The thing that changes is, is then you get a land right. Where you were on that day in 1848. So if you are Kaiapoi Māori sitting in Moiraki, you now get land rights in Moiraki, which you may or may not have a whakapapa right to, but under the Landless Natives Act, 
you get a right to land down there. So therefore what happens is, is now I, as a kaipoi Māori, have all of these rights down there, I don't necessarily have land rights in my own papakainga. So now I have lots of say down the south, not so much say up here. Uh, it's 150 years-ish later it takes to, to get our claim back. At that point, we, were, we had to settle with the best we could get because how many generations can you keep fighting? At some point, you need to stop and you need to find a way uh, out of that. Matiaha Tira Mori, who leads that campaign. And so he, alongside Ngā Tanahira Wari Wari Tū, alongside Peter Te Hori, alongside my power, um, uh, Tāme Parata, they start to drive uh, the Ngaitahu claim. Uh, yeah. And again, our tifuna was so wise. You know, they, they come up, we, we find these beautiful phrases of which they're reminding us all the way through this, and it's still a phrase that's used at Tuahuriri today about dignity, poise, uh, and gracefulness. So when our, when our tipuna have reminded us through the generations of, yes, there is a fight to be had, um, but do it with mana. So continue the fight, but there is a way of doing it. Uh, we don't need to get down and dirty. We carry ourselves with this poise and dignity. Uh, because that's the way we have always done it. So the last one I want to introduce to you is my ancestor, Tione Tare Tikao. Again, why am I introducing you to my tipuna? Because this is their kōrero. It's their manuscripts of which we get this phenomenal amount of information, and it's through their manuscripts that we fought the Ngaitahu claim. Tione Tare Tikao, if anyone knows Ariana Tikao, this is her poa, her her ancestor, um, he's here on the peninsula. He brings a different kind of kōrero to the, to the fore. So Tione Tare Tikao is a wee bit younger than these other fellas. So for, ten, for his first 10 years of his life, he is brought up uh, in the, in the, as a tohunga, the tohunga. So he learns about that traditional worldview, the traditional practices of our people and the history of our people he is the last student that goes through that particular school of learning, which is out on the peninsula. What happens after that is he then gets taken and he gets trained by multiple others. So the kōrero that uh, Paua Tione can give us is sl somewhat slightly different. But the one kōrero which I love the most about this fella is he talks about our creation coming from the water. So often we hear the creation story of Māori creation saying there was Rangi and there was Papa and, you know, Sky Father, Mother Earth, they have children, um, you know, they're stuck on top of each other, the children separate Mum and Dad, this is the very quick version of it, um, <laughs> they separate Mum and Dad and, um, you know, the world starts to exist as we know it now. There's versions of that, there's a Ngaitahu version of that, which is slightly different. Te One Tare Tikao tells a different one again. So although that is the same characters doing the same business, quite literally, um, uh, everything starts in the water. So in Te One Tare Tikao's view, the most important thing in the world is water. Without water, nothing can exist. So all of that creation story in Te One Tare Tikao's view, starts in the water. Everything starts with water. Which is somewhat different from all the other narratives you read anywhere else. And it's the point at which the mum and dad are separated that they come up out of the water and open up the world. Which is quite a beautiful way of thinking, you know, when you think about uh, water births and things, about this emerging to the top of the water and then we start to see life and light. So he has an important kōrero to tell, uh, however, it is quite different. Some of that is potentially because he, he has the same learnings until age 10, and then he has layers of other learning on top of that, which starts, when he starts to record it as an old man, there's a bit of mix of those traditions. So Te One Tare Tikao uh, is that tipuna, so he was, where are we? 
So he's born around 1850, these guys. Why are these guys and even vaguely important? Because they start to tell the story of us moving into Ōtautahi. Q Ōtautahi. So what we do know is that uh, we settle uh, in Kaiapoi Pa and then we start to disperse. And the cousins start to disperse all over uh, Te Waiponamu, but in particular around the peninsula and uh, south down to Taumutu, to the centre of my universe, uh, by Lake Ellesmere. And uh, we also start to trade in the city. So there is a pa here that exists. Um, there's, there's two pa in Central City. Uh, we are in O Tautahi in Christchurch. Uh, Tautahi's pa is up by Kilmore Street. We are on the edge of Puari Pa. So there's various kōrero about both pa. This one is a waitaha. Just correct me if I make up new history, Corbin. Uh, is a waitaha pa. Uh, we know that um, these were operating in the um, 1800s. Kaipoi Pa is established in the 1700s. Uh, the Pa in Central Christchurch start to establish in the 1800s. There are still traces of those active Pa's in 1860, and then they disappear. The city starts to get built over top of it. We are on um, uh, Puari Pa, or Tautahi, the home of Tautahi, is the name that's by and large given to Christchurch City, Central City by and large, but it actually refers to the pa of Tautahi, or Tautahi, the pa of Tautahi, which is up here uh, at Kilmore Street. This pa here, Puari, uh, is quite a big pa. Uh, we know that it goes from around uh, the hospital all the way through this area that we're on, all the way up to Bailey Ave, and in some cases it's estimated that it does end up towards Rickerton. So this is Puari Pa. Uh, why do we know that? How do we know that? Uh, there are historical records which tell of uh, where our mara were, where our gardens were. There are historical records of uh, where our graveyards were. Um, so we know that where the current te pai is, um, the convention centre, which used to be where the old public library was. There are very clear records of the bones that were found there laid in rows. So that was part of our graveyard. Um, so we know we have these records uh, of this pa. Why were we here? A couple of reasons. There's this beautiful Mahinga Kai site that winds all its way through the city. Mahinga Kai, the places where we work resources. Mahinga kai. Mahi to work. The workings of our kai. Kai in its broadest sense, not just food, although most of it is food. Um, kai in its broadest sense, our resources. We have the best, well, we had the best mahinga kai sauce you could possibly get with a beautiful river called Otakaro. Not Otakaro, which is what I heard today. Uh, Ōtākaro uh, is our Mahinga Kai site, so that was the place of which we were feeding our people. It had a sufficient number of uh, wetlands attached to it. It's little wonder that our city kind of fell over during the earthquake, because uh, we're on a whole heap of springs and riverbeds and such. So our pa wasn't here permanently because we knew that at the time. Um, and we were here getting kai as opposed to building big pa as such. Uh, so our people were coming here. We were coming into Christchurch to these pa. We were coming to Christchurch because remember Kaipo pa had fallen. We needed somewhere to trade. There's a lovely place in here where the settlers are now settling down and we can trade the stuff out of our gardens. We can trade stuff uh, that we're collecting and harvesting from our waterways. Uh, we are taking stuff from our natural environment. Uh, we've got lots of stuff to trade. So we start to move into the city. So here we are, Puari Pa. So I talked about trading places. 
Victoria Square. So think of Victoria Square. It used to be called Market Square. That was our marketplace. So we came in and we traded uh, because we're, we're living rural now. We're living outside of where the main settlers are. We've lost our rights to our land in here. We've lost our rights to our pa. We move out. We move out to our communities out in the rural areas, by and large coastal areas, uh, and we come into the city to trade. Uh, in 1860s, 1860s, we make an application to the Crown and we say, you know that piece of land over there? It's called Waipapa. Waipapa Little Hagley Park, on the edge of our traditional park. And we say, we've been camping in there when we've been bringing in all our kai. Because we're travelling from Kaiapoi on foot. We're travelling from the peninsula on foot. We need somewhere to rest while we're here. We come in to... Uh, that little place which was, was ours, but is no longer ours, we are camping, um, we actually want to put a permanent structure there so that we're not having to bring everything with us and rebuild every time. Um, we get given horse tethering rights. Horse tethering rights on what was our traditional land. That starts a battle of a hundred years that we fight for our right to be part of the economy of Christchurch City um, and have a right to sleep on our own land in a real structure. It takes us 100 years. 100 years to have that fight. 1980s, 1980s, so this is 1800s, 1860s, 1880s, we start the fight. 1980s, there is a beautiful national marae built on top of an old dump in East Christchurch that is compensation for what we asked for a hundred years earlier in North Hagley Park. This is our history. This is our history. Why do I tell you that history? Some of the biggest objectors to um, us having our rights there across the road here. Some of the biggest objectors were sitting here. So we are now longer on our path. We are out in the rural things. We ask permission to come back onto our own land. 100 years we fight that and we get given a piece of land over there. Um, I'm, it's a horrible, horrible legacy to have to know that you have to fight for your own rights in your own place where your own tipuna established the rights to be here. That is the world of Ngaitahu. It is the world of iwi Māori. Hence why we are a little bit, um, we get a little bit hoha uh, when we have to ask permission to do our own stuff in our own place. We kind of are used to fighting it and we will fight it. But, you know, being able to have opportunities like this to share that story so that you too can understand where we've come from and where we are going. So being able to rebalance story to say, yes, we welcomed the settlers here. Yes, we shared our land. Yes, we shared our resources. Yes, we wanted them to be as much part of Aotearoa as we are. But at what cost? At what cost? We can see the stats now today. We celebrate the best statistics and the worst with health, the highest, highest rate uh, in prisons. You know, we, the stats that you don't want to be the top of, we are the top of because we have this history where we are alienated from our rights to succeed in our own place. It takes a bit of time to turn that walker around. And it is turning, um, but it, you know, it takes a wee time. So, so you start to understand this is our story. And there's no pointing or blaming or any of that stuff. It just is. It just is. And this is how you know, a number of us have landed where we've landed. And that's why people like me take the great opportunity to say, let's rebalance narrative. Let's understand our collective history. Let's think about a way forward because this is our, we're making history now. 
we're starting to understand the stories of this land start before a building turns up. Is this making sense? Yeah, a couple. So there you go, Otakaro. So we were using Otakaro for Mahinga Kai, we were using Otakaro uh, to cleanse our people, we were using Otakaro as Rungwa, as healing, for healing our people. We were using the river to bless our people, to wash our people, uh, and there are points on that river actually where we were burying people. So it was our main route um, through the city, it was our main food resource, it was our building materials resource, it was our everything resource, or takaro. Hence why we get a little bit protective about it. So there we are, Waipapa. So you will see this image now sitting at Waipapa. If you're down by Housemore Lane, that was a very deliberate, very, very deliberate stance to take back that place, to literally tether our horses in that place and to reassert the mana of Tuahuriri in the city. Quite a deliberate ploy. So this is taken, this image was taken in uh, um, 1905 with the visit of Lord Plunkett out to Tuahuriri. One of our tikanga out there at Tuahuriri is when flash people come to our place, we go out to the edge of the pa, we send out our flash as fellas, so our tipuna dressed in their absolute finery to go and acknowledge that an important dignitary has arrived and we will now bring you into our pa. So this image was taken in 1905 out where I understand it is out now by the motorway heading in towards um, Kaiapoi. That's how far our pa at Tuahuriri extended. They rode out in their finery to welcome Lord and Lady and to escort them into the pa. This image then gets taken um, and placed here in the central city. It then gets taken and placed uh, in Athens and it then gets taken and placed uh, in, in Kessel in Germany and then gets brought home. Uh, why are we doing that? Again, we're acknowledging these ancestors and their connections and how flash an artist Nathan Porhill is to get accepted in Documenta 14 to take his work overseas. Um, but it is about this re-establishing the mana of Tuahuriri. In particular, it then gets placed over here at Waipapa to again re-establish that connection of we actually are in Tuahuriri's turf and we are actively rebalancing story because when you want to know why that is there, I'm going to tell you. That's why my ancestors are there. If anyone was around in um, 2015, we had Te Matatini, the national kapahaka, uh, across here in North Hag Hagley Park. Why did we do that? Because Pua Media had this great idea about reasserting mana whenua back in the city. In 1906, there is an international exhibition which is um, supported by a large by this institution across the road, um, and the exhibition is based upon um, uh, a number of activities uh, that are New Zealand activities, because of course it's a New Zealand international exhibition. And as part of that, there is a village. That village is called Araiteuru. Uh, on the establishment board of designing what that village will look like, like and the purpose it will have, uh, is one, uh, one person, one ngaitahu person, uh, a te uru, I think, from Tuahuriri. But by and large, Tuahuriri are excluded from those discussions because we're fighting over that piece of land just over there. So we get, by and large, excluded from the conversation. The designers of that are um, non Māori uh, ethnologists, historians, and the like. Uh, with one or two Māori, which by and large are not our, our Māori. The village gets designed and it becomes a copy of parts of it, uh, copies of Taupo, parts of it are copies of Whakarewarewa. So we have a beautiful steam bath and all these steam rocks and uh, mud baths and things happening over there. It's 
just delightful. Um, and we have this wonderful village with this carved gateway and it is manned for a year. So from November um, 1906, this, this village runs for a year. It is a hosted village, so you can come and visit the Māori at the village uh, for a year. It has been hosted by pretty much non-ngaitahus. The ngaitahus that do end up participating in the village are from down south because we're still busy fighting up here for that piece of land. Uh, so that goes on for a year. Um, why is that village there? Because it is to smooth the pillow of the dying race. It is the last opportunity to see a Māori village in action because we are disappearing. We are being assimilated. We will no longer exist. So you've got one year to come and see what a, what a real Māori village looks like. Araitiuru, 1906, North Hagley Park, 2015. Araitiuru, Te Matatini, 2015. We put up all of the images of those tipuna, which now we've got 5,000 Māori coming down from the north who now see their ancestors on the walls of that pa. Why are we doing that? Because Tuahuriri needs to hold, hold its own pie. 1906, 2015, Tuahuriri finally hold the pie in that village, Arai Te Uru, uh, in North Hagley Park. Takes us a wee while, but we get there. So that is, again, Tuahuriri relaying its mana in its own place. That was a huge statement for us, huge statement. Uh, it took a lot of work to do that, but I was determined this generation would start to address um, some of that disparity and address rebalancing of narrative. So we're on the move. Each cultural narrative I write starts to readdress that balance and bring that cordial to the front so we can acknowledge it and we can say, let's not go back there again, eh? Let's figure out how we go forward together. So this is my opportunity and I keep taking it, so thank you for indulging me. Um, there's the gateway. If you ever go to Te Papa, level two, that big carved gateway in the open area, there it is. 1906 Hagley Park, there it is. So it's one of those interesting um, times for, for us, but a, a good time in lots of ways. So quite, quite a um, statement, we are on the climb, we are reasserting and rebalancing story. Part of the work we are currently doing in the city, you see it all over the city. So te reo Māori is no longer a foreign language in its own landscape. So we have te pai, we have tūranga, I'm working on a beautiful Māori name over here. Uh, we are <laughs> te matatiki toi ora here, of which some of us use that as opposed to the art centre. We are re-establishing and reasserting our mana and language. We are re-establishing and reasserting our kōrero and design and the spatial layout of buildings. So we're quite clear about we will be visible from the front door to the back door. In language and design and um, thresholds, uh, no longer is it okay to back your toilet pan onto your kitchen because that is a, a transgression of, of tapu and noa. So what's going in here shouldn't be sitting right beside what's coming out there. So thank you, Mr. Architect. You'll move your pipes a couple of metres away over there. Thank you very much. Take the pan to the other side. So this is an opportunity uh, for us to reassert te reo Māori as our language and normal. It is normal New Zealand language. So we are taking back our names, we are reasserting our names, we are reasserting our stories and our history, um, and we are trying to rebalance the kōrero that's always been there, that we knew about, um, but it's now time for us to learn about it. So it is a long journey. It is a long journey to turn all those stats upside down. 
and to get our people well and healthy. When our land and our environment are well and healthy, then so too are our people. So it is a long journey, uh, a journey that some of us have been on for a wee while and probably will be on until our last dying breath and our children are already on it. Uh, so I think that could be me-ish. Ooh, look at that. So um, what is the story here for uh, Te Matatiki Toi Ora is that we do have a Māori advisory committee here now that starts to support um, Philip and the team uh, here about how do we engage with Māori, uh, for Māori, about Māori, how do we re-engage those um, amazing things which we've always known about, which Aotearoa is just learning about, and things like matariki. You know, for us here it's puaka, um, but what are those things that we know about that we, we, we want to share this stuff? Uh, for here at uh, Te Matatiki Toi Ora, you're here on Wednesday night, the upcoming plans for Fariki that will st now start to lay across uh, this facility, uh, like the Fariki Manaki that already lay or Takaro, so 13 paved mats. Um, those same artists are doing work here. We are working with our own artists about how do we bring our artists back into this space to re-engage uh, because we know there is a gap in the market for Māori artists, equally for Pacific artists. So what can we do to grow that? So we are on the move. There's lots of things ahead of us, lots of really exciting stuff. And having this kind of opportunity to talk about those stories and to share those stories and say there is a way out of this. There is a way out of this and there really is. Now's the time, now's the leverage point for us to celebrate who we are in all of our glory. Um, the good stuff, the bad stuff, the uh, stuff, um, it is just who we are. So I am looking forward to the future for Te Matatiki Toyota. I am looking forward to the future for Christchurch uh, and for Waitaha and for my grandchildren's grandchildren. Uh, because that's most of us, and I, I look at all my whanaunga here, you know, we are about our grandchildren's grandchildren. We're not actually here to do the stuff for ourselves. Um, it's for those following generations, and if we can leave this place in a better place than where we walked in, then we are winning. We are absolutely winning. Nō reira i runga i tērā, nei te tuku mihi ki ao koutou, and I'm eight minutes over, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> If, if there are any pātai, uh, any questions or any kōrero, I'm very happy to, to have that discussion equally. Um, I'd also happily just tag the whanaunga and if there's anything else that I can't answer. Um, just, I am a jack of many trades and a master at nothing except typing. I can type. Um, <laughs> nō reira, i runga i tērā, nei te tuku mihi ki ao koutou, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa.